Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Pull Up with Limbs and Things. Tonight, we're talking about physical therapy for future colleagues. I brought along my friends, Dr. Tiel Maloa, who is the owner of Body Soul PT, and Dr. Shakura Evans, who is a pediatric physical therapist. Dr. Loa is in California, and Dr. Evans is in Illinois. So welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for joining tonight. Let's talk about some of the things we want to share for people who are interested in physical therapy. But before we do that, I wanted to let all of you know that Dr. Loa, Dr. Evans and I, we all had like a meeting at an American <laughs> Academy of Physical Meeting of therapy. the minds. Yes. yes. <laughs> at the American Academy of Physical Therapy in 2019. Oh, not Loa. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, we say names right around here. <laughs> okay, I got it. Okay. So we had a meeting and we were all just chatting, talking about our goals and what we wanted to accomplish. And we were each at the cusp of something we wanted to achieve that we had not yet achieved. And so at that meeting, we were just casually talking. And really at this point, we've all leveled up. We've come to the point where we have decided, okay, I'm going to do those things that we talked about. So you're meeting us at the other end of that goal. And so tonight we'll talk a little bit about that, but we just wanted to let you in on that as well, because we do have a connection from that point and it has strengthened our ability to move forward in the future. So welcome both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah. So to introduce be. yourselves. You can go first, Tiana. Well, hello everyone. My name is Tioma. I'm out here in Oakland, California, and I'm the owner of Body Soul Community Wellness and Physical Therapy. Nice to see everyone. Yes, uh, and my name is Shakur Evans. I am out here uh, in Illinois, uh, and I am a pediatric physical therapist. I work school-based therapy. I work for a co-op, and so we service 16 school districts. We provide therapy in three different counties. Um, and then I also do some PRN with the local hospital and home care. So that is me. Awesome. So tonight we're talking a little bit about what you don't know about physical therapy, some things that you know. So each time we have pull up with limbs and things, it's to challenge something you know, to confirm something you don't know, and to be able to share that information with someone else. So if you're watching, you have a question as we talk, of, as we go along, please put it in the comments and we'll talk about them. Looks like we already have a comment. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ladies and fellow physical therapists, what is one thing that you would tell someone who's interested in this field about being in it now that you are a veteran PT now? Gosh. Go ahead, Shakur. <laughs> um, I would say... Like when I was in school, you know, uh, my professors would always push, you know, as a physical therapist, you need to be a lifelong learner. You need to be a lifelong learner. And um, that is like a fact that is probably going to be uh, one of the keys to you being a successful clinician because science changes. The human body doesn't change, but uh, best practice changes, uh, scientific met updates happen, and you need to stay abreast with that so that you're doing the latest and the greatest. And I think they tell you you're a lifelong learner, but then it's hard to commit to that as a practicing clinician because you get in the hustle of bustle of work. So you may do your continuing education class because you have to get it. And then you don't apply that knowledge because you get right back to work and you're in the hustle and bustle of work. And then you look up and you find yourself behind the needle and you're wondering why your patients aren't making progress and, you know, things like that. So uh, having that commitment, if you're a person that loves to learn, um, this is a good feel for you. And I think just re remembering that always, that was something that I, I think I really didn't take seriously. And now that I'm in the meat of my career where I want to be the best, I'm um, back to that every day. I'm looking at something just like I was when I was a student and I was trying to get the grade. It's like every day I'm trying to get the grade every day. I'm re looking at something again. So that's how you stay great. And you really have to be on top of that. And that was pretty perfect. Yeah. Um, can I hear the question again, Dr. James? Sure. So <laughs> if there was something that you um, 
sorry, <laughs> when you first started PT school, is there something that you feel that you would want someone to know that's coming into the field? Yes. Okay. So I highly would recommend, this is why I tell um, all my students, um, coming into the field, physical therapy is great, is a great profession. But I would always, when I was at Howard, uh, Dr. Simpson, she's like, you know, OGPT. And she told us, if you can just stay in school a little bit longer and get that extra thing, stay in school and get that extra thing. So whether it's, um, even if you're like an undergrad and you're majoring in uh, sports um, in kinesiology or sports medicine or exercise science or something, go ahead and get certified as that personal trainer or that strength and conditioning coach. Uh, get that extra master's in uh, strength and conditioning or exercise physiology so that you can, so, uh, I mean, you might not be fully firm on what you wanna do, but at least you have something extra to uh, market yourself even better than just having your physical therapy degree, not just, I don't want to say like just having it because having your physical therapy degree is awesome, but just something that gives you that extra edge. I, I would say go for it and and take that extra year to, to, to do what you got to do. And I promise it'll pay off for you. Okay. I would say someone who actually loves people. I think to be mm -hmm. in this field, because we're so hands-on, I guess I'm more on the the not so clinical side, mm -hmm. but you want to have a good bedside manner with people. I think to be a good therapist, you have to have both um, yeah. just so that people will, of course, do what you want them to do. Because a lot of times we're asking people to do something that possibly hurts, to do something that possibly does not feel um, like it's something they want to do. And so those things are, are needed, I think, um, as you go into a field to know, is this really what you want to do? So I'm, I want to ask you a question about that because you say yeah. you have to have good bedside manner, but how would you say somebody even knows if they're not, they're interested in, P, in PT school? How would they know if they are leaning towards that trend or edge of having good bedside manner versus not? Mm. I think we've all had encounters with a healthcare professional that was good and bad. Mm -hmm. So if you know how you want to be treated, you want to treat that person the same way. But then also having your experience where you're on the other side as the clinician as opposed to the patient. So getting that internship experience, possibly observing someone, uh, whether it's a volunteer basis or a paid one, that'll give you a good idea. You know, can you handle all personalities? Are you willing to handle, you know, people who are difficult to work with? So that's where I think I would answer that. And you know what I would add that is a very uncomfortable thing to do, but ask for feedback. So I think sometimes, especially when it comes to bedside manner, that's not always something that people share with you, like when they give you feedback, even in clinicals, they're like, oh, you know, uh, yeah, you wrote up this evaluation, great. And, um, you know, they give you a lot of feedback on your clinical skills and you have to be specific about the type of feedback you want and then be open to somebody telling you, yeah, you are not very personable. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So, you know, you, you want to seek that feedback, like ask, you know, go do that clinical, that, that internship, those observation hours, you know, mm -hmm. and ask for time to communicate with the patient. And then when that patient leaves, ask the supervisor or the licensed therapist, how did I do? Do you think that I was, you know, friendly? Do you think that they, you know, ask for that specific feedback and then you'll get it and you can work on it before you go to PT school? That's good advice. Yeah, no, I definitely think that's good. And I wanted to just piggyback on what Dr. James was saying about, getting that experience. So I remember being an undergrad and we had to get so many hours of experience in the field that we wanted to go to. Um, my major was kinesiology. So everybody wasn't necessarily going into physical therapy, but I knew that I was. And so just there's so many types of physical therapy, uh, so many different types of certifications. You can get so many areas that physical therapists work in. And so especially while you're a student, especially if you're in high school, if you are an undergrad, use that student status to the best of your ability. Who doesn't want to help a student? Everybody wants to help students. Everybody loves helping students. So get as many different types of physical therapy experience as you can. Go work, uh, intern, volunteer in a hospital, shadow a PT that works in the hospital or someone in a skilled nursing facility or someone in a nursing home, uh, go to your university, 
and um, and shadow on the sidelines of football games and basketball games. Uh, all you have to do is ask. You'd be surprised how far you get if you just ask people um, and tell them what you're like, what you would like to do, and what you're interested in. I remember sitting in a clinic back in the day as a student in undergrad and thinking about all the things I would need to purchase to have my own clinic. And now I'm just like in that space, and I'm like, I didn't know specifically that I wanted to own my practice, but I knew I had to have all this stuff and I just kept that in my head. So um, get as much experience as you can so you can know what you like. It will help you lean towards what you want to do. That's good advice too. Okay, so piggybacking off of what you just said. Okay, okay. let's let's play a little game. <clears throat> Raise your hand if you have worked in skilled nursing. Worked right. in skilled nursing yeah. or like Inter, actually shadow anything okay. you got experience in skilled nursing okay. okay okay raise your hand if you have worked outpatient okay raise your hand if you work school settings two hands <laughs> raise your hand if you worked in pediatrics okay raise it pediatrics it okay i'll just say youth sports yep. Anybody you under 18, something? you can raise your hand. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if you worked home health. Yeah. Chanel, we out here. We're just, uh, what are we just? I do home health. <laughs> okay. Dr. James and I, I guess we just out here. <laughs> okay. <I'm kidding. laughs> yes. Okay. Raise your hand if you have done. Mm, what else, y'all? Spinal cord injury. Okay. Brain injury. You've done industrial, like um, I haven't. So I, I want you guys to have so I can pick your brain. Yes, anybody uh, that's oh, like consulting about on ergonomics care? or with a company. Yeah, I haven't done ergonomics um, like specifically, but with different people, yes. Right. Are we talking about as a, a field? Yeah, like if you work for like oh. a Fortune 500 as their like therapist. Oh. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what else what did you say? Acute care. Yep. Yeah. Setting, everybody. Yeah. And are we and missing any is. settings? There's so many. Aquatic therapy. Oh, never worked in it, but did a clinical. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> and then what about um, if you've done like veterans affairs or worked with people who have come back from war, anything like that? I think I had like one student rotation briefly at Walter Reed Hospital, but that was the extent of that. Um, is there anything else? What am I missing? I'm oh, sure there's more. There's so many specialties, but I don't know. But I think we might have covered all the like. Women's health. Has anyone done women's health? Okay, no. I, I have very little experience. I, I've taken a course, but that's about it, women's I want health was what I thought was going to be my career in game. It was either that uh -huh. or peds, and peds ended up being the final winner. Gotcha. Okay, so now that we know a little bit about our backgrounds in terms of professionally, where did you guys go to school? And would you I recommend to, someone go there? So I did my bachelor's at Bowling Green State University in Ohio. Um, and then I did my doctorate at Hampton University, the real HU. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Hampton University in Virginia. Uh, and Hampton is a, a small private school and it's a historically black college and university. So, um, and would I recommend that you go there? So we're talking PT school, correct? PT I'm not gonna school. go into undergrad. Yes, yes, I would. Um, when I went to Hampton, we were actually the first new admitting class after they had not taken a class in about three years. Okay. So there were a lot of um, learning curves, a lot of bumps and bruises. And I think in the early years there, I was unsure of the long sighted vision. I was just a kid struggling in class. Um, and now in hindsight, it was the absolute best, most nurturing, most supportive program. Um, the curriculum is solid. And I learned how to um, work in a diverse population because we had, you know, on both ends, my program was culturally diverse. Um, and then just to be a part of a program that was made for people like me to succeed. And I felt that every day, no matter how hard it got, no matter how you know down I got, if I wasn't doing well on a test, I knew those teachers wanted to see me win. 
and they were going to pick me back up. And, you know, you're going to, you know, you didn't do well on this, Shakora, but you're going to take it again and you're going to pass. That's how it was. So I highly recommend um, that program and HBCUs um, in general for post-grad training. Just big HBCU advocate right here, but definitely Hampton. That is great. They should do a little commercial with you in it. <laughs> Okay, well, I went to uh, San Jose State for undergrad and I majored in kinesiology and I'm mentioning San Jose State University. Go Spartans! Because the kinesiology or I don't know, it might be called the human performance department now was just amazing at San Jose State University. I learned all my palpation skills there. I knew a lot of, I was highly prepared for physical therapy school after graduating from San Jose State University. Um, and so I really appreciate San Jose State University for the undergrad training that I received. Um, and then I went to the real HU <laughs> University, HU, you know, yes. <laughs> so um, from, coming from California, I had never planned on going to an HBCU. So I um, will say like what Dr. Shakora said that I highly recommend, um, especially as African-Americans, if you have a chance to attend the HBCU, whether for undergrad or grad school, go ahead and do it, please apply. Um, so I had a great time at Howard University. I uh, had um, a great physical therapy school experience at Howard University. I don't, it, I will say it wasn't quite the same as what Dr. Shakora was saying as far as, you know, okay, you can do it. I mean, I feel like I <laughs> that from teachers, but I, I feel like they were very, very hard and very, very tough on us, but for a reason, because they knew they were training Black African-American professionals that would go out into a very real world and have to know their stuff better than a lot of PTs around them just to be accepted, just to be qualified. So we had to know, you couldn't pass Howard or graduate from Howard and not know your stuff as a physical therapist. It just didn't happen. So um, shout out to HU for training me and helping me to become a physical therapist. And then one more plug for Alabama State University where I received my doctor of physical therapy. So um, yeah. Yes, now that you all are done advertising <laughs> your schools. Yeah. yeah, so I went to Alabama State University. I'm a 2009 graduate with my recreational therapy degree. It was a great segue for me in terms of going to physical therapy school, more so for the hands-on experience uh, with the clinical aspect, I did an internship at Warm Springs, um, and that was an opportunity for me to work with people who had spinal cord injuries and traumatic brain injuries um, as a recreational therapist, but also working alongside physical therapists, occupational therapists, and speech therapists. And it was a great segue, of course, with also the maternal and child health pipeline program that Alabama State had um, that was for undergraduate students interested in going into physical therapy school. And at that time, Dr. Woodruff and Mrs. Um, Katrina Waters were over it. And um, I got to do a lot of the things, um, seeing different, the, the cadaver lab, I think was probably the most impactful um, in undergrad before getting into the PT program. Mm -hmm. And I did go to ASU for my doctorate of physical therapy degree as well. So yes, I agree. HBCUs are the way to go. And you now have three of them that offer yeah. physical therapy programs that you can possibly apply to. Did you want to say something, Dr. Tion? No, I was just giving a thumbs up. Oh, Do okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have a few comments over here. And before they get okay. too many, I wanted to address them. So I'm not a PT, but I know that the test isn't a joke. Be prepared to study your heart out. Do you guys want to comment on that? You know, that's what I just kept thinking when um, Dr. Tiamo was talking about just the rigor of the programs. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is something that um, people interested in the field just do need to understand and be ready for. You really need to have the grit and the tenacity. And, and, and I don't want to discourage people by thinking, you know, if you if you're um, because to me, it's not really about the aptitude, but it's about the work that you're willing to put in Absolutely. because the programs are very intense. Um, and the minimum requirements to get into a DPT program are intense. So you really need to know um, early on in your collegiate career what GPA you need to be shooting for, what GRE score you need to be shooting for so that you can even be a viable candidate. Um, and then when you get into the program, you know, these are three-year doctoral, all-year-round programs. They are 
um, intense. And then that program culminates with a licensing degree a or a licensing test, a national licensing test um, that is the kind of end all be all summation of your your educational training. And so if you don't pass that in test, if you have not prepared yourself, if your educational program has not prepared you to pass that exam, you will not be licensed. You cannot practice. So all of that seven to 10 years, whatever route you took that you you've been on to get here, um, you know, you'll have to sit down, you'll have to keep trying to take that test. So he is very correct in that. And that is a process that you really need to be aware of. And some people don't know that when they decide right. that they want to be a therapist. And so then they learn it and they get either very discouraged um, and they're like, I don't want to put in that much time. Um, I don't think I have the aptitude. I'm not a science mind, you know, especially as African-Americans, we get told very young, we're not good at science. We're not good at math. Um, oh, and so, yes. And so we talk ourselves out of these type of professions early on and we doubt ourselves. And so I don't want to underestimate the, you know, I want to be real about the rigor of the program, but I also want to be very honest in the fact that you can do it. You just need Absolutely. to have the tenacity and the grit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I want to say like failure also isn't final. I had to learn that lesson um, in undergrad in preparation for physical therapy school. Chemistry was just not my jam. OK, I just me and, me and chemistry did not get along. I probably took chemistry about three good times and still the final time just barely passed it with a C. But I passed it enough to get into PT school. I also I had to take anatomy and physiology twice. Anatomy and physiology are very the basics of what you need to know and take in undergrad. But sometimes learning it the first time is something completely brand new that you may not, for me, I hadn't taken any of that in high school, so I hadn't heard it before. So by the time I did take it the second time, I was a pro because it's like, okay, um, I, I'm starting to understand this. So sometimes when you have to take things over, it just means that you're learning it even better than you would have known it had you only taken it that first time. And it's okay to hear things two and three and sometimes four times because now you have more mastery of that subject level. So just because you don't pass something the first time doesn't mean all is wrong with the world and you have to give up. Take it again and you'll be surprised at how much you actually did retain and can apply towards the future tests and studies. So you can you can do it, just, just keep with it. I agree. I don't think anything else needs to be said about that. <laughs> All right, let's see. Be a good listener and learner with a dose of humor. Always gets the job done for your patients. I agree with that. Do you guys? Oh, yeah. Everybody <laughs> likes to enjoy the person they're with. So if you can, you know, vice versa, it makes it the day goes better for you and you build that rapport with your patient and therapy goes better for them. Exactly. Second, physical therapy allows you to create adapt adjust and innovate your life experiences and your clinical skills to advance in the profession ask questions always and push the boundaries that sounds like a, a fellow pt doesn't <laughs> okay um pt and governmental um have you guys um seen anyone who works in the government that's a pt um, I we had uh when I was a student at Howard someone come from the government um and that was a government PT and I actually just took a class at California a course at California PT virtual P CPTA virtual um association we had uh some PTs that are that work for the VA but I don't know if they're in the government or not but they did dry needling here in California and in California we can't do dry needling and so they but they were doing it because they were part of the VA system and yeah. so um but there are PTs that work you know in the army yeah. for the they go through basic training right. yeah me, they I actually, actually considered that. doing that can y'all believe that you yeah. just started doing basic training oh no I said I thought <laughs> I'm doing that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, in and out <laughs> I know um briefly my roommate in grad school her um husband was in the or her now husband was in the military and at the time that he was going through basic training we actually looked into what it would take to be therapists with the military um mm -hmm. because there's a little bit more uh autonomy in how you practice, practice and yes and your scope in the military yeah. that was pretty impressive mm -hmm. and when you come into the military as a dpt um 
and I, if somebody's out there who wants to correct me, please do, because this is just, but I believe you can come in as an officer with that degree. Yeah. So there were some perks there, but basic training did us in. She, when we found out we had to do that, she and I looked at each other. We were like, no, nah, we'll just stay ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we're not I doing it. Do that. <laughs> right. But, oh, I also wanted to mention, there are physical therapists that work on insurance boards. They review documentation, help us to, um, in turn, get paid for physical therapy services so long as they can ensure that what's written is actually what actually occurred. Yes. Um, yep. Yeah. And then another thing fellow physical therapist said, physical therapy also allows you to own your own clinic and make money to help to rehab people. Oh, he's a Hampton grad too. But hey. <laughs> All right. Hello, Miss Hill. Anybody else? If you're watching us, live you can hashtag live if you're catching this on a replay you can hashtag replay and again if you have any questions or comments that you want to have us answer or to discuss please put them in the comment section as we mentioned dr shakora is in illinois and dr tioma is in california these are this is their contact information if you would like to get in touch with them so we didn't talk about this but let's talk about what you guys currently do okay Whoever. Okay, I'll go first. Okay, so I currently um, work, I work at Kaiser in outpatient um, part time uh, as an outpatient therapist, basic orthopedics. Um, and then I also own my own practice uh, that I run the other part of the time, body, soul, community wellness, and physical therapy. And so, um, yeah, I've been even though I've had a lot of experience in a lot of different types of physical therapy, I kind of landed in outpatient general orthopedics. So I see, you know, back pain, knee pain, neck pain, shoulder, you know, from anything from the neck all the way down to the feet. So um, if you have some more specific questions about what I do, let me know. Are you still teaching? Uh, not right now. When the pandemic started, I took a break from that just because it was just a lot. So, um, but I actually really enjoyed teaching and being in the classroom with the students and helping them learn. And we didn't talk about that then. So who has taught in um, physical therapy education? That's my dream. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> my dream. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would definitely... Um, love to get back into it um right now it's just having the time to juggle so many different things but i was um teaching uh as an adjunct at samuel merritt university here in oakland california and um teaching their uh first and second year um orthopedic course so and general skills uh, clinical skills course so um always fun to help you know brand new students learn uh, uh basic PT skills. So yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Okay. Dr. Shakur. Uh, so I work primarily as a school-based physical therapist. Um, I'm the lead physical therapist. So I supervise a team of, I think we're six right now. We are fully staffed. We did not start off the year that way. So uh, that feels good. Um, and so I work with students with disabilities. So when people hear that I work in the school, they usually like, they're like, do you work with injured athletes? Like, what do you do? But there are actually children um, in school with um, congenital abnormalities, you know, uh, disabilities that they are born with. Um, and they need to have the proper equipment, the right adaptations and accommodations so that they can access the school environment. And that is what I do. I help students reach their, reach their maximal uh, function in school so they can run and play with their friends and they can, you know, get their computer out and have the right posture for their computer and have a supported sitting seating system and they can access the playground. And so I play with kids all day to keep it plain. Um, but I really am passionate about what I do. I believe that every child, no matter their physical abilities, has the right to an education. And so I help make that happen. And then on alternating weekends, I work in home care in the in my city. So I get to two totally different sides of the spectrum. Home care that I see is mostly geriatric patients. And so I go from kids um, to helping mostly geriatric orthopedics. I'm a little bit of stroke rehab. Um, some generalized weakness. Mostly people have just gotten out of the hospital for whatever reason, and now they're deconditioned and they need to get back to being independent at home. And so that's what I do on uh, rotating weekends. 
Awesome. I want to thank you for helping me when I started pediatrics at the beginning of the pediatrics. And oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I am currently working in geriatrics. So I see aging adults in DC and Maryland and Virginia, and I see them wherever they may need therapy. So it could be in their house, it could be in the grocery store, a park, getting in your car, any of those things um, to help you move from I can't to I can. That's me. <laughs> so, I wanna, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention, like, um, going towards your passion i know dr shakora was saying that she's very passionate about um kids and her 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 young young kids that she helps in the school and i wanted to mention that i i was an athlete i played basketball in all basically high school middle school and then in, in undergrad and so i found out about physical therapy from an injury from a really bad ankle injury and then i continued to pursue it and so i i just always love working with athletes working with high school athletes um and that was really my true passion and is still my true passion and when she mentioned like pediatrics in schools, I remember doing rotations in school. And that for me, it was just way too emotional. I was sad all the time. Like it was just too much for me to see kids that she works with, with those types of disabilities. And I couldn't, I would be, will start crying before I could finish a session. So I was just like, okay, when I'm with the sports, I don't start crying. I'm like, hey, <laughs> I can coach you. Hey, I need you to run them ten laps. I need you to jump on this box. I need you to do this. So I, when I, so that passion, I think, is really important. And when you know, like, that's what you have a passion for, I say pursue that. And when you know there's something that you just can't handle, like, then it's okay to. That's why there's so many different areas of PT you can work in. So uh, more power to the people that works with kids because I just works with the kids with disabilities because I can work with the kids that's on the sports teams. Come on, send them to me. But the ones with, that have disabilities, those are it's, for me, it's just way too emotional. Yeah. And doing those clinicals helps you figure that out. So something yeah. someone told me in PT school that I always tell people interested in it is that uh, PT school creates a generalist. So even if you think when you go into PT school, like, you know, I want to do sports or I want to do peds or I want to do whatever. Um, when you go to PT school, you're going to do clinical rotations or internships in multiple settings in, across the lifespan. And you are going to be required to do that. And a lot of people don't like to do that. They want to just come in and say, well, I want to do all outpatient orthopedic rotations because that's what I know I want to do. Right. But that's why they make you do that. And the test is a test for a generalist. It's not a licensing test for a specialist. So then when you become a licensed clinician is when you can officially start to specialize. You think about the clinicals that you did that you really love that every day, you know, that you didn't want to leave and you try to find a job in that area so you can hone those skills. You take continuing education classes in that area to hone those skills. You can become a board certified specialist in that area to hone those skills. And so one of the things I love about physical therapy and why I chose it is because I felt like it was a profession I could never get bored in because there are so many settings and so many populations. And if I get, if for some reason I wake up 10 years from now and I'm like, peace just doesn't do it for me. I can start a whole new career yeah. in a whole new setting, like mm -hmm. I'm starting all over, but still with the same practicing license and the same credentials. And so you never get, you can never be complacent. You can never get bored. And I just love that about this field. But yeah, the kids, the littles, they inspire me. So yeah, you just have to find your niche and doing the different clinicals is how you do that. Yes, absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, that's what I would say about physical therapy too. There are so many different facets within the same profession that help you to diversify yourself as a clinician, kind of how we talked about how we've all done different uh, settings, but also how you're able to continue to pivot. Because a lot of times, like even for me with the pandemic, um, coming back, I was trying to come back in March, back into a skilled nursing facility when the pandemic began. And so I had to pivot to PEDS because that was telehealth and I felt that was safer for my family to do. And so um, that possibly would not have happened in a different career. And so with physical therapy, you can pivot to another setting. You don't have to have like a ton of experience in it, but you can have a mentorship. I even got that mentorship from Dr. Shakora. So, you know, there, there are ways that you can continue to thrive 
and change if you need to when things are not as you want them to be in your current setting. Okay, well, we man. have a question or comment. Tioma, how does the well-being of your soul and physical therapy compare to each other? The well-being of my soul yes. and physical Preach to us, please, Reverend. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Thank you for that question. I really appreciate it, actually. Um, so for those of you that may not know, I'm also an ordained Baptist minister. And so I went to um, divinity school at Emory University at Candler School of Theology. And so when I got there, I did not know. I was already finished with physical therapy school. And so I made sure I did uh, that first so I could work my way through my next master's program. And I didn't know if I should combine um, what the two things. I didn't know if I should just keep, you know, ministry and physical therapy separate. Um, but when I uh, got there, Emory was a very collab. Emory is a very collaborative um, university, and so they encourage you. Um, mixing like medicine and being a lawyer or um, public health with uh, faith. And so they had a um, faith and health certificate track within the divinity program. And actually it was Dr. Woodruff uh, from Alabama State uh, that highly encouraged me. She was like, you have to do both. You absolutely have to. And then one of our uh, our preaching professors, her name is, um, shout out to Dr. T, Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. She was actually a speech language pathologist and, and but she's this highly skilled preacher. And so she using what she knew about speech language, I mean, you have to hear her preach, she's amazing. So um, Emory opened the door to allow me to see kind of where faith and health can come together and combine. And so, which is why I started uh, my practice, Body, Soul, Community Wellness and Physical Therapy, because one, as a physical therapy, I work with the body, but also I acknowledge the spiritual component that comes along with how we manage our, how we cope with illness, how we uh, respond spiritually to being injured, to being hurt, to being in pain. And so um, even um, I'll mention it, I always do like a brief spiritual assessment at the beginning of my physical therapy evaluations just to kind of get an idea. And I just mention it just so I have an idea because the research shows that most people like their doctors to at least have an idea about whatever spiritual practice they uh, practice because of how it can interact with their health. So just having that awareness. And then I let them know if something comes up and we need to stop and do that, then it comes up. But for me, that's really important. But right now, my um, my faith tradition is uh, Christian. It is, um, I grew up in the Black Baptist Church. And so the way that I uh, try to integrate it is by providing education to uh, uh, faith-based, faith congregations. Um, congregations of uh, Baptist churches. I'm sorry, I'm, my words are getting mixed up. I do community health education from the uh, PT lens to the church and faith-based organizations. And so, and I do that because in PT school and in any you know healthcare program, you're going to learn that African Americans have the highest rates of diabetes, have the highest rates of stroke, have the highest rates of cancers, and die from that. And and a lot of African Americans, a good percentage, attend church are very spiritual. So if there's a way that I can combine the education of everything that we're dying from or have the highest rates from with where we practice spiritually, then what kind of marriage is that that can help us to become healthier people? So I'm sorry um, about that. So that's that's kind of what feeds my soul. And that's kind of where I like to merge both of my professions. I say I'm bivocational. I'm a Black Baptist minister, but I'm also a physical therapist. And I help ev help everybody by acknowledging the spiritual component and providing the education to help us live our best and healthiest lives. So. <laughs> All right. We got it. Yes. And with that said, I will say that next Saturday's October 23rd, I'm launching the Health Empowerment Series, where every month we'll be uh, virtually teaching on uh, some 
topic that physical therapists can teach on, but it's geared toward congregations of faith. And so the first session will be called physical activity for mental health, where we'll be there. I say mental health, physical activity is good for mental health, but whoever teaches about what the parameters around physical activity are. So that will be the purpose of the session. So um, I guess I'll give the information to Dr. James for if you all want to put it in the, the uh, chat. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. Let's see. Thank you for that question. All right. I'm in ortho with specialty on the spine, which requires great understanding of skeletal system, neuroanatomy, and general anatomy. I've done acute care in hospital, skilled nurse in pediatric, and now outpatient orthopedic. Orthopedic is more fun for me. All right. Mm. You've done a little bit of everything. <laughs> All right, ladies, is there anything that you want to say that we have not said that you think that somebody who is interested in, say they're on the the cusp of putting in their application to physical therapy school, not necessarily the school choice, but what they need to know in terms of what you need to do to get to the end to graduate PT school? I will I say, think, oh, go ahead. <laughs> um, I I would say, if you're in the applica uh, in the application process, or if you are thinking about being in the application process, I suppose, and you're not sure if this is the direction you want to go, you probably haven't done um, enough observation hours. Um, to every program is going to require you to do some type of observation hour, some more than others. But if you're still like not sure, it's probably because you haven't immersed yourself in the field enough. Um, and so I think the more you see it, because that's what it was for me. Once I was in there, I was like, oh, I never knew this profession existed, but this is what I want to do. So I think get out there a little more, go to another setting and you'll decide, OK, I, I, you know, I'm not on the cusp, any, cusp anymore. I see that I can visualize myself doing this. And then as far as once you get in, because you're going to get in, so positive thinking, positive thoughts, manifestation. Um, once you get in and you're in the program, I think the most important thing is to find and build that support system early on, uh, because there will be challenges in the program. Um, and so you're going to want to have a strong study group. You're going to want to have a strong support system outside of the program that understands the dedication and commitment and the stage of life that you're in. Uh, Cause there may be times where, you know, you don't make it home for that surprise event. Cause you're, you know, you're just dedicated to the, the curriculum or you can't be places that your peers are because your, uh, <laughs> your time commitment for your schooling is, is grand. You know, it, it takes a lot. So building that support system that's going to be there for you when you feel a little discouraged um, and that study group that's going to, you know, buckle down with you is going to be essential to figure that out year one, day one. Um, because that's what's gonna hold you through the ups and downs of the program is what I would say. Yeah. yeah. I definitely agree with that. And there's um there's more options I think available now because well, when I was in physical therapy school at Howard, we did have the AAPT, the American Academy of Physical Therapy, which helps uh minorities in physical therapy profession. Um, we also, there also is now the National Association of Black Physical Therapists that you can collaborate with. And then there's also, I think, a Facebook group on the Coalition of Black Physical Therapists. So there's um, people uh, that you can outreach to now to kind of help provide that support to you. Um, I also want to mention that when you're studying, because we talked about studying and the grind of it, um, just a nugget that I tell students the day or two days before the test isn't the first time you should be reviewing your notes isn't the first time you should be hearing that information again when it's before the test you should have reviewed that information at least three to four times so that is literally a review you should not be learning learning anything new before the test it should be a review to you and if it's not a review to you then you have to spend more time immediately after the lectures in the first days after you've had that lecture to really fully review the information and make sure you understand it and utilize the office hours and utilize the assistance tools that your professors provide you because that's going to be 
very, very key. And then, like Dr. Shakur said, your study groups. If you find that one study group like isn't working for you, like they people have a different style of studying than you do, or they're learning in a different way that you do, or at a um, slower or a faster pace than you learn, then it's okay to switch it up and work solo or with just one other person versus with 10 people, because sometimes too many people can hinder the study process, but sometimes it can assist the study process. So you just have to know what kind of studier and learner you are. Finally, I think it would be remiss to say that uh, there is a real issue within our profession of um, provider and clinician burnout. And I don't think it's fair not to mention that. And so I think in understanding, just because as a student, everything can look very glamorous, but when you're actually working, believe me, you're working. When we're working, we're working all day. We're seeing patients all day long. And so self-care is going to be key, learning how to take care of yourself, learning how to take care of your mind, learning how to take care of yourself physically, and, and engaging in your profession and doing things that bring you joy and make you happy and bring you peace so that you're not so stressed out all the time. So I just wanted to mention that. I think what we don't say enough is that PT school is grad school, but it's grad school on steroids. Mm -hmm. To be very honest, it is a very rigorous program. Um, it can challenge you, challenge you to the point that you wonder, like, is this something I really want to do? But also there may be tears. There may or <laughs> may not be tears. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you're going to experience people who study differently, just like you'll have patients that do things differently. Um, each one of us probably knows someone in our class that you wouldn't send your patient to, but you also know someone in your class who you wouldn't send your patient to. I mean, there are so many things that come up as you are in PT school. And it is one where you would have to push yourself probably a little more than you ever have um, in terms of getting to the finish line, because there are so many obstacles in terms of just trying to keep the grade point average, but also do this uh, clinical, like this teacher wants you to do it. It's, it's so many different facets that we, we know that happens, but we don't always talk about. And as um, African-Americans, it's a lot that is riding on us being successful. And you know that you always have to do a little bit more. And so whenever you are um, in front of someone, you have to give your best. And I think in our colleges that we have gone to, we've been pushed by some people who've actually said those words very bluntly like that, but also ones who have pushed us in that direction without saying those words. And so it's just important as you are going through school that you know that the end goal is that MPTE and that you may have to work even harder to be successful in that as well. MPTE is a national physical therapy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The <laughs> National Physical Therapy Exam that we mentioned earlier um, in terms of making sure that you are not only prepared for it, but that you do some of the aspects of what Dr. Tioma was saying, how the information is new to you when you first um, are studying for it prior to the exam. But you also give yourself some time to have self-care. You know, you got to take care of yourself, just like the advice we give a lot of times as healthcare professionals. We tend to give the advice, but we don't take it ourselves. <laughs> and so we definitely need to do that because yes, burnout is real. And it's something that we all have to face. So it's just important that we consider all of those things as we are giving you information about getting into this field. We just want you to have the real information so that you have a well-rounded view. <laughs> successful. So yeah. else I want to point out really quick is what since we're talking about um, a well-rounded view, we we danced around it, um, but I think we need to make it plain because being an African American or a person of color in this profession adds a whole nother, just like being a person of color in America, adds a whole nother layer to the uh, the sometimes traumatic experiences that you can <laughs> that you can have going through school and in the workplace. And so we are less than 10%, uh, you know, minority healthcare providers in physical therapy. And there are, I think now almost like the a APT has been there 
you know, that's how the three of us really, all three of us know each other, right? I would not know the two of you if it were not for that. And so there are organizations in place for you as a student. Um, I had the mentoring program for the AAPT now to help really nurture Black students along the way in this program so that you can succeed and you can build a network. Um, but sometimes this can be a very isolative experience and especially depending on where you work. You know, me being in central Illinois, I've been a therapist for almost 10 years. I have yet to work with another African-American therapist, male or female. If you work in the D.C. area, um, you know, I have co-workers in the B&B area and they have some they, they've had other you know, co-workers of color. And I'm like, I need to move because <laughs> but, you know, depending on your geographical area, depending on your specialty, um, you may be the only and you may be the only for a long time. And so that's a, a realistic expectation to have. So you need to be sound in what you know. Um, because I think there can be a lot of imposter syndrome that can start to take over when you're there. You start to feel like, do I belong? You know, should I be here? Nobody else is here that looks like me. Even if you don't consciously feel that, that yeah. happens. And then you get one microaggression and you start to doubt yourself. You're like, oh, well, maybe I don't know, you know, maybe. So that's a, a real thing that we battle. And I think um, the American Academy of Physical Therapy has been such a nurturing soundboard for me with that and a place that you can kind of come to and feel at home and feel safe. And there are giants. There are, when you feel like the only one day to day, I mean, there are minority giants in this field who have progressed, not just, you know, not just paved the way for us, but paved the way for physical therapists all over the country. So we are here, we are leaders in the profession. Um, we are trailblazers in the profession. And so, you know, just know, you know, even when you get to school, depending on the program you pick, there may not be many other faces like yours, but we are out here. We are here for you. And there are plenty of places where you can go for refuge. And we understand. Yes, we've <laughs> been there and we're still there. So, <laughs> Yes. And as a, a um, caveat, the American Academy of Physical Therapy is having a conference virtual conference this year. So if you are a physical therapist, you are a physical therapy student, you're interested in being a physical therapist, you should check out this year's conference. It'll be held November the 5th and the 6th, and it will be free to all registrants. Um, and it can be found online. I'll put the information on the screen shortly. Were you gonna say anything, Dr. Tiona? Um, nope, I think, I think we covered it. Okay. Well, I thank you guys so much for coming and sharing all of your expertise about being a PT and, of course, about how we can help someone else who's interested in, be, in becoming a physical therapist, but also all the nuances that we've experienced and ways that we can support you in your effort to become a PT. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope we answered your question. If we did not, please feel free to put it in the chat. And either Dr. Sioma, Dr. Shakur, or myself will answer it. Thank you, ladies, so much. I'm so glad to have had you. Thank you for having us. Thank no you problem. so much. It's always good to see you, beautiful ladies. I miss you. We miss you, too. <laughs> good night, everybody.